Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so my dear congregation, I'm going to ask you to join me by closing your eyes this morning. Promise me, though, you won't fall asleep. <laughs> I want you to think back to a time where you had to forgive someone. What did you do in order to forgive that someone? Were you able to forgive them right then and there? Did it take a few days, weeks, years? Or are you still forgiving them? We are going to stay within this thought for a minute. What kind of emotions were running through your head and heart? Do you still feel bitterness? Okay, please open your eyes. Let me share with you a time of how I am still working through forgiveness. This year has been a rough year for my family and I. The death of my marriage and family of eight years has put a cloud of darkness over my eyes and heart. Dealing with alcoholism, being unwanted, unsupported, and disrespected needed to come to an end. Well, alcohol abuse has always been something that I dealt with with my father. I never expected my husband to do the same thing. I was blamed for his drinking because he was mad at me. I slept in my car some nights to not hear him verbally rude things to me. During these months, I found help through Alamo, but the drinking never stopped or lessened. The drinking at times became hidden. There have been many times where I didn't feel a part of the family. I felt that I was just there to do the cleaning and to watch the kids as he worked nights. There was disrespect for my stepson, and since we have never really connected, life at home was uncomfortable, tense, and there were lines and sides taken. Was I the best wife and mother? I can honestly say no. There were things that I could have done better, should have done better. But now all I can do is take care of myself and my son. I moved out of our home March 6th of this year and lived with my alcoholic father for a month. But because his home was toxic as well, Adam and I left and moved to an apartment in New Hudson. During this month at my father's, my husband didn't call or text me to ask me to come home. And without the feeling of being wanted, I knew that moving out on my own was something that I had to do. So with all this being said, I was sad and lonely, hurt and mad. But can I carry this negativity around in my heart? Or should I find a way to forgive myself and my husband? This forgiving had become a daily task. But it was this daily test that allowed me to find God and clear the darkness that surrounded me. I'm going to share a passage with you that has allowed me to move forward and think about what the darkness had done to me. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you. Because the darkness is passing, and the true light is already shining, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. He does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. That's First John 2, 7-12. After reading this passage over and over, I realized I had to find a way to let my hate fade and to forgive all involved. My way to God, to the light, and to the forgiveness was found through worship and soul. Let me share with you one more passage. passage I'm sorry. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the world. Let us... Um, yeah, thank you. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and exile him with music and song. Singing in the choir here helps me every Sunday with finding the light and embracing the hate. But what about Monday through Saturday? How can I keep the hate away 
and allow me to forgive. There is one song that brings me to forgiveness, and that is playing by Kesha. Her lyrics help me daily to take my pain away and to turn it into prayers for everyone involved. Let me share with you some lyrics that open my heart and eyes. I am proud of who I am. No more monsters, I can breathe again. Because I can make it on my own, and I don't need you. I found a strength I've never known. I hope you're somewhere praying. I hope your soul is changing. I hope you find your peace, falling on your knees, praying. With this song and the previous passages, I have realized that I have no room in my heart to hate. I can and I will forgive. To bring myself closer to God, I will continue to worship and sing and not, and not allow the hate to take me into the darkness where I will stumble. I will find the light. So brothers and sisters, let me leave you with three questions. Who do you need to forgive? What will you do to forgive? And what steps will you take to allow the forgiveness to take place? listening to the lyrics and listening to the words and it inspires me. Uh, 
I had I get these inspirations from those. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall off stage backwards. <laughs> but still, I, I, I'm, who am I to really be up here telling you what God wants? What God God doesn't need me. Honestly, I'll tell you, God doesn't need any of us. He, he, he is all that all powerful. The sermon really isn't very high on my list, so obviously if you can't see that, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place I'm ridiculous too. But if he doesn't need us, he wants us. He wants us with him. He wants us in that relationship with him. Straight it up. Don't believe me? Think about the characters in the Bible. The ones that we really look at their stories and, and really delve into the, the what God is doing in their lives. Uh, they're murderers. Moses. David. Let's talk about David for a second. This young, scrawny little shepherd kid that kills Goliath with a strap of leather and a, a river stone. I was like, he, he, he's greater than all of the entire army around him. They're shaking. And he says, all right, I can do this. Only with his faith. His faith, his love for God. He steps up and he does this. But then again, he becomes king. He finds this woman he finds attractive. Sends his, her husband off to get killed. And he wants him for himself. So, oh, how the mighty have fallen. But aren't we all fallen? Even in the Romans, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Not just a few. Not just a couple. All. We all have sinned. We all have sinned in our lives. The, and this is what's so great about our God. But we got to remember that with God, when he's looking at us, any sin, it condemns us to death. I, I struggle with this in my mind and heart all the time. Why, why would he love anyone like me? A perfect man. Why would a perfect man go up on a cross and die for me, for you? But then I go back to Jesus' own words. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than he? He loves us that much. He loves us so much that he sacrificed himself. He, he loves us more than the most majestic and the most peculiar animals in the world. <laughs> that middle one on top is our dog. Over there. <laughs> he's, a, he's a big rush. He just wants a relationship with, with us. He wants us to be with him. It's not about our sins. It's about our relationship. <laughs> Christy and I, as Joe has mentioned earlier, we have a small group. A small group every Friday meeting here at 7. Every Friday here at 7. We play games. Uh, we we switch, switch between game nights and discussion nights. So game nights just have fun and kind of run along. Uh, the other night of the discussion nights, to really build those relationships. Uh, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be doing life together. During one of our Friday discussions, uh, Christy had some bunch of questions he brought up and we kind of blurted out, blurted out one of who's God to you? And I'm normally, I'm, I'm actually very quiet. Don't believe me. <laughs> but, but at this one day, I've got a meeting and I can't answer that he's a loving father. But there's, there's, there's a difference. He's, he's a loving heavenly father. Because I know I myself, I am not always a loving father for people. Um, I fail miserably. I know some, some, some childhoods can really kind of be apprehensive of seeking God because of this. Because you see, because of the fatherly aspect. But let, let's turn this around a little bit. Let's go to the who are we to God? Well, you know? Children, we 
we are, we are children. But children, I see children as being a little bit ambiguous. It's, I'm like, okay, my son's here, he's 19. He's still my child. But he's growing up. I see us more along the lines of toddlers. Because, well, to be honest, toddlers don't know anything. <laughs> and while well, doing like this, Chris, Chris and I have three kids, three boys. Uh, we call them the boys. They're really not boys anymore. Uh, let's see, they, 19, are uh, 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 applied physicists in the making, which we, he, I'm glad he doesn't try to get our help with homework. <laughs> uh, see, uh, our middle one, Gabe, he's 20, he's a uh, professional hermit. <laughs> then, of course, we have our Alex, he's, uh, he's actually off a blacksmith convention today, which is very weird. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a Southland firefighter, and, and we're, we're proud of each of them for their own reasons. They're, they're all bright, smart, they're all funny, they're all very, they're our kids, they're our boys. But it's, like I said, it's more of a term of effect, uh, affection for us. Than what they already are. Uh, but well, one day, when, uh, back then, with having them so close together, we had roughly about nine years of toddlerhood. <laughs> <laughs> From the age of one to four, with the, the overlapping, nine years of toddlers. That's a long time of diapers. <laughs> and it was when we first started. But, anyways, uh, any parents out there have those moments when your toddlers just are quiet? Oh, yeah. I see faces going, uh huh, uh huh. Uh -huh. Well, I had one of those moments when Alex decided that um, you can't quite see it very well. But that little hot spot on top, he actually found a little pair of scissors. I told you I wasn't the great father. <laughs> and he decided he would cut his own hair. Uh, needless to say, it did go back. <laughs> Which, he hates that photo. <laughs> I, I keep telling him it looks like Sideshow Bob from The Simpsons. And he's like, ooh, what's that? And he actually, uh, the reason I actually found him is because the cat yowled and he actually decided to cut the cat's hair too. And he did it with the cat. Oh. It was just a little tiny nick. The cat didn't stay away from him for a while, but uh, it didn't be 18 years old, so I think it was all right. <laughs> Anyways, think about when a toddler learns to walk. When a toddler learns to walk, they, they stumble all over the place, they fall, scrape their knees. It, it's tear, tears and sorrow everywhere, for, at least from the toddler's side. Uh, but if you really think about how Christ, what Christ said, for in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's an exclamation point in there. You take heart. He wants us to know he's serious about that heart. He's serious about that love. And if, look it up. Look in the Bible. That exclamation point, I didn't add that. That's actually in there. I was like, I didn't know they had those back then. <laughs> <laughs> but as a toddler learns to walk, he grows holding hands with something. And, and that's, that's, how I, I, that's why I say I equate us with toddlers. Because if we're holding Christ's hand, the entire time. Oh, we'll, we'll stumble. We'll scrape our knees. But he won't let us fall. He'll hold us up. And that's that's the relationship he wants with us. And I, I found this one too. I thought it was funny. No, I'm not talking about Twitter. I literally want you to follow me. <laughs> <laughs> just had it. Trying to get some serious signs. <laughs> but. That's some serious heart that he had for us. We all, we've heard stories, stories about parents that have risked their lives, even given their lives to their children, for their children's safety. Think of what Christ did for us. He not only gave his life for us, but I'll let you know a little secret. He came back. And he's coming back again. I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you with this little note that, that whole struggle that I've had with keeping, keeping Christ on my heart and on my mind. Uh, a friend of mine, he, he's, he, he struggled that way too, and he's, he told me the one way that he's always been able to overcome it is whenever those distractions come into your mind, into your heart. He says, give it to Christ. Just say a prayer, give it over to him. He wants them. He took on flesh for us. 
He knows what it's like to be human. He just wants to have a relationship with us. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Good morning, church. Somebody asked me if I was nervous coming up here. Well, oh, sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, sure, I'm nervous, nervous, but I feel like this is family. This is almost like talking to family. It really is. This is a home. Well, uh, Mark Beeney spoke to us last week, and he said he had something that had been stirring him for quite a while. And I think Steve also said that this morning that he had something that had been stirring him for a while. Well, I had since last winter. It was I sat beside the pool at my daughter's down in Florida. It started to develop. It came to me. And I really believe that uh, there's a word here for us. I want to talk about the power of words this morning. Where words come from, they come from our tongue. And uh, our tongue is a very small part of a member of our body. Uh, compare it to the arms, legs, and shoulders, and muscles of a, of a bodybuilder or a weightlifter. That's real muscles. A weightlifter is able to lift 582 pounds. I believe that's, I read that's the record. Imagine the power of that body. And, uh, and then there are people who can um, swim 2.4 miles. Don Ford, I can make one length of the pool. <laughs> and, uh, and then they also bike. They go on a bike for 112 miles. And that's not enough. <laughs> they have to swim. I you know they have to. They have to run for 26.2 miles. You know anybody like that? <laughs> <laughs> but think about the power of, of the members, right? And especially in, in those people, the lungs and the heart. So really this is powerful. Well, the Bible talks about the power of the tongue and words. I'm still learning that this, this, Pastor Joe said when, uh, in one of the teachings, he says, you, he believes you get more out of the word of God when you speak it to people than when you hear it. And this is really, really stirred in me. And I'm trying to live this. <clears throat> uh, what about God's words? Well, God has words, yes. Genesis, the first chapter, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, how do we create them? It says three words. He used three words. Let it be. So let, it, let there be sun, moon, and stars. Let there, be light. Let there be plants and animals. Three words. He says, let there be. That's some powerful words. We know God speaks, and uh, his son, Jesus, who came to this earth, John in his gospel said, in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is called the Word. And Jesus had many words that he spoke to people when he was here on earth. And those words are still vibrating all around this earth. And, and uh, And he said, people have heard his words, so we never heard a man speak like this. His words are unique, and they still are today. 
Have you ever watched the program uh, Forged in Fire? These gentlemen that make swords to uh, try to make the strongest and sharpest sword that you possibly can. And then they proceed to cut everything up. They <laughs> get their hands up. <laughs> they love to chop with their swords. Well, the Bible talks about sword. It's in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than to a sword. And it can divide between soul and spirit and bone and marrow. And it understands the thoughts of our hearts. We have to read the words of Jesus in Luke 4, 6, 43 through 45. It's titled, The Tree and Its Fruit. It says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes, or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And this is the key. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Who, who else in the scripture talked about words and the tongue? Uh, Solomon, wisest man the scripture says ever, he talked much about this. And here's just a couple, here's just a couple of the things from, from the Proverbs. Proverbs 12, 18 says, words are like swords, thrusts, sword thrusts. There's that sword again. Um, 16, 24, it says, gracious words are like healing the bones. And then in 1821, Solomon says, the tongue brings forth, brings forth life or death. That's pretty powerful. Then there's the Apostle James, who uh, in his letter to the church, and, uh, he, he gives a whole chapter, chapter three, Talking about the tongue. It's not important. In uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, A person is perfect if nothing is never at fault if he is perfect in what he says. And then in verse 3, he says, We put bits in the mouth of a horse, a small bit, and we can turn that horse. And control it. That's powerful. Words are powerful. And then in the fourth verse, he says, uh, ships, again, uh, like, just like the word ships, huge ships are turned by a small rudder. Words are powerful. And then in 3 5, he says, a great forest is set aflame by a small spark. And he says, the tongue is like a fire. We have to be careful with our words. And then he says, with the tongue, people praise God, and they also curse the fallen man. He says, that ought not to be. Watch the tongue. So where does this leave us? How can you and I control our tongue? If Jesus said, out of the heart, the tongue speaks, what's in my heart is very important. There's more of God's word there than my own thoughts and uh, feelings. But that, that, has, that has a better chance of going on. And also getting close to our Lord. As close as we can. It's like getting close to a friend or another person. It rubs off on us. 
These are a few things I've learned about my tongue, and I'm still learning. <laughs> well, I, I realize that words spoken cannot be deleted. They go out there in the people's computers, and they can often be retrieved years later. Some happy or encouraging things said to us, or some terrible, hurtful things said to us. Words, power of words. The other one that's I find so, find so important is talking to our spouses. It's something I didn't just learn overnight. <laughs> Let's say to, to women, one of the greatest things you can do is honor and speak well of your husband. I think it's one of the greatest things you can do. And then men, speak words of appreciation to your wives. And encourage them. Encourage them. Never put them down. Never put them down. Indeed, you are defined by your words. Now, parents, this is the big one. This is the one that I've often, I had often a hard time with. Words with my children as I grew up. <laughs> but I believe today if we, one of the great important things is discipline of children, but never put them down. Never put them down. We control our anger, which I have had a hard time in my children way on. But if we do, they'll be the same, I believe. I, I've done some woodworking in my past, and I still do a little bit. And I work with power, woodworking power tools. And any of you that have done woodworking, you know that these tools are, they operate at high RPMs, and they're very dangerous. And I always think carefully before I use them. It's very easy to lose fingers or more. And, but they were created, these tools were created to make things that are strong, things that are useful, and even beautiful. People can make some beautiful things from wood. And I think that's just like the words. I, can, I, I think about that a lot. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> salvation and in initial entrance into God's kingdom comes in, in Romans 10 9 by confession that Jesus is Lord and belief that God raised him from the dead. So there again our words come out. <clears throat> I want to thank Pastor Joe for allowing us to speak. I think he must have some confidence in us people that he's taught us well. <laughs> so I leave you with, as the credit commercial, credit card commercial says, what's in your wallet? I would say, what's in your heart? really cool hearing Wally talk about how he's still, you know, working on things and how he still hasn't fully developed, because uh, it makes me feel a lot better about, you know, not having it all together. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm going to talk about how I don't have it all together today. Uh, one of the uh, things that, make me, that makes me unique um, is I, I have this gift. It's, uh, I see when I look at somebody, I can see the absolute worst things about them. Like that. Yeah. I don't know if you would call that a gift, really. Yeah, I feel real secure right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh no, not any of you. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm just, when I see somebody, I have a hard time focusing on the good things. I just see all the bad things about them. Um, so I have a hard time loving other people. Um, I think we all struggle with loving people a little bit. Um, you know, we all have at least that one or maybe two people that we have a hard time loving. It could be a neighbor, coworker, uh, someone at school. If you have a sibling, definitely there's someone that you can. I have four, so like I've done the research. I know you're gonna have trouble loving people if you have siblings. But uh, uh, I struggle with it a lot. Um, so I was gonna talk to you guys about how I've worked over the past several years on working to love people better. Um, I used to think of loving other people as like advanced Christian, <laughs> that you have your not so great Christians down here who don't really do a good job trying to follow God, and then you have your mediocre Christians here, like your mid-level Christians um, who follow the main stuff, and then your super Christians who just, you know, they love everybody, they follow, they've never done anything wrong, and I was super okay just being, you know, an average Christian. Um, <laughs> I figured I'd love somebody maybe at some point eventually, um, and I had justification for this, and it was from the Bible, so you know, if you have the Bible as your reason for doing something, then nobody can argue with you. Um, and it came out of the, the great commandment. Uh, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus, uh, what is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend on the law and prophets. So the way that I saw it was the big, the big one is just love God, and then you know if you got, if you got to it, there's a number two there. It's kind of weird that he has a number two. Like Jesus was thinking, that's a great question. I'll give you a bonus answer. Here's number two. It's like uh, it made me think of uh, those lists that uh, David Letterman would do, where he did the top ten thing. Does Jesus have? a list of, of commandments in order of importance. Um, are they about love? Like, is it love God, love people, and then love animals, plants, minerals, down to whatever's at the bottom of New Jersey, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> like, is there, is there an order of importance, or could it be number three, maybe something totally different? Like, love God, love others, and then drink enough water or something? I don't know. Um, but that's how I saw it for a long time, is that it's, uh, this is number one, and then less important, it's number two. But uh, as, I, as I read this passage more, and as I read through the rest of the Bible and what it has to say on love, uh, I realized that it's not a, a one-two necessarily. And Jesus even says it there, he says, the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, if we're to look at 1 John 4.20, it says... If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And that ruined my whole plan, because my whole plan <laughs> was to love God and hate my brother. Both of my brothers and my sisters, too. <laughs> so that ruined my whole plan. I couldn't use the Bible anymore to justify not uh, working to love other people. Um, so John is saying here that our love for others is proof of our love for God. And this is a pattern that we see through the Bible where there's definitive action that uh, shows stuff that we can't really, you know, actionably do. So for instance, um, James says in, uh, in his book when he's talking about what real faith looks like, what it means to have a real faith. He says, for as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. His main point being that our, our works, our actions prove that we have a real faith. Uh, in the same way Jesus says in Luke, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Um, pointing at how our obedience proves our belief in God. And in the same way, in 1 John it's saying that our love for others proves our love for God. Uh, because God made the people around us. My question is, why does it have to be loving people? Because um, God made lots of things. Why couldn't I love deer or something like that? And that be... <laughs> and that just be enough. Why couldn't that prove that I love God? But uh, people are slightly different from deer. They're <laughs> just a little bit. Um, and that people, 
people are made in the image of God. Um, and so, you can't, you can't say you love God and then hate the image of Him. Um, Wally brought up uh, James 3 earlier. First, I'm going to say this thing. <laughs> I could go for a really long time talking about it. What all it means to be uh, made in the image of God, and you know, it's a complex idea, but the basic idea is that the image of God means that humans are like God and represent Him in a little way. Um, now, where to James? Um, it says, uh, this is where he was talking about the tongue, and uh, just talking about how ridiculous the tongue is, saying, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Just pointing out how ridiculous it is to say we love God and then hate the image of Him. If we loved God fully and understood how amazing He is, and really believed that we are made in this awesome God's image, then how could we treat each other with anything less than total love and respect? And that's kind of my poor way of saying that, of uh, summing this all up. Um, but I have this quote from C.S. Lewis, who he's a little bit better you know, communicated than me, so I'm okay saying that he said it better than me. This is from his book, The Weight of Glory, talking about um, just what an honor and responsibility it is to be around people who are made in the image of God. And this is what he says about the people around us. He says, there are no ordinary people who have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a man. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, smell, and exploit. Immortal glories are everlasting splendors. And then he goes on to say this next part, which just blows my mind every time I read it. He says, next to the blessed sacrament itself, next to the body of Jesus, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Those are the people that I hated. <laughs> the, the holiest objects presented to my senses. And it's easy to hate people when you view them as a problem, a waste of space and not worth your time. When you only see your focus on the bad things about people, it makes it easy to justify treating them poorly. But if we thought about the people around us, our neighbors, co-workers, family members, as the holiest objects presented to our senses, I think it would be much easier for us to love other people. And that's what I try to remember when I'm, I'm having, uh, having trouble with this. Is that what I'm going to say?